partecipanti non mi vedo come host. Ah, no, scusa, scusa, scusa. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, of course. Shoo, shoo, shoo. Yes, now you are. Sorry, sorry. You are right. No, but I was thinking about YouTube. You have all the connection. You have the, you know how to connect to YouTube, the password and the other stuff. Yes. Okay. No. So we are... <laughs> no, but I hope <laughs> it will work. No need. Okay, welcome to this uh, virtual series on complexity. Welcome back. This is the sixth appointment, so the time goes fast. We start in October and now we are almost in December. Uh, I really thanks, uh, thank a lot of the, the speakers of today and of course all of you to be here and all the people that are following us on YouTube. Uh, as usual, I just remind a few things. On the web, web page of the series, you can find the announcement of the next uh, and the last uh, seminar of this year. It will be 15 of December. And we will, ha we will have um, Ofer Lahaf from uh, UCL, UK, is an astrophysics. Uh, and I don't know exactly the title, but uh, he will tell us about the new research in big data and astrophysics. Um, some technical information before starting. Uh, okay, each seminar it will be about 40-45 minutes uh, and the discussion will be at the end. Uh, um, of course, uh, uh, if you have uh, questions, uh, please uh, write on the chat. I th think that since we are not so many, maybe you can just ask directly, maybe hands, the, you know, high, raise the hands and just uh, tell us what is the question. Uh, we are recording the seminars and the speakers, of course, have knowledge to record them. Uh, our first speaker today will be Michelle Battlefisher. So I'm very happy that she's here because uh, she will talk about something that is not exactly related to all our topics and very interesting. Michelle Battlefisher is a system, think system thinking scholar. I'm very happy to understand exactly what is a system thinking, since I'm a system biologist, and very interesting to know what is it. And uh, is, she's also bioethics from the United, of course, United States. She's a currently a research manager for Equitas Health Institute. She's an adjunct instructor at Temple University Center for Urban Bioethics, and adjunct assistant professor at Wright State University, uh, Bunshoff School of Medicine in US. She published an influential academic monograph. This, uh, uh, the title is Application of System Thinkings to Health Policy and Public Health Ethics, uh, edited by Springer. And she's published a lot of papers on system thinking, bioethics, humanities, communication studies uh, in many journals. Um, she's also standing members at the Bertrand Laffy Center for the Study of System Science in Vienna, Austria, and she's a research scholar with the Rowan Institute in US. So, Michelle, thanks a lot to be here, and please, the stage is yours. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for being here in this time of COVID. It's, we have so many other things that we could be doing. So I very much appreciate your time. And please have some grace if there are some difficulties with technology. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, I assume everyone can see my screen. Okay. I'm going to move some things around. There, that's much better. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very, very happy to be here. And as you can see by the abstract, um, I'm coming from the world of social complexity and systems thinking. So I am doing something I'm very excited to discuss but it certainly may be an outlier for what the other seminars have um, done that's taking place up to this point. But again, I'm very grateful to be here. Um, as introduction, hello, my name is Michelle Battle Fisher and I'm with the Equitas Health Institute in the United States. I have other um, academic appointments 
My talk today is African American Urban Health as a Complex Adaptive System, a Call for Urban Bioethics and Complexity Ethics. And it's an honor to represent public health by applying social complexity and systems to public health disparities. And I would like to thank the organizers of this series for allowing me to have this opportunity today. As far as financial disclosures, I have none to report. The presentation was created without any commercial support. Being marginalized in a less than ethical social system. So let's begin. Um, while there is some comfort and expectation of predictability of agents' actions in physical systems, uh, there's no such relief in social systems. Uh, people can do what they want to do and often do. Ethics um, provides guideposts to support actions that are acted upon in everyday life. But human agents are endowed with the ability to act upon that intention if the social order allows such freedom. But for African-Americans in the United States, it's not so easy. The United States has gross health disparities that further marginalize populations that are already under immense social, financial, physical, and emotional, emotional stress. Now the percolating attention to health disparities brought about by COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter bears the question whether the current system produces ethical, equitable health for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and that's abbreviated BIPOC. But for the sake of this discussion, this seminar will concentrate on the African-American experience. I argue that a paradigm shift that connects complexity thinking accompanied by systems thinking used as a scientific principle and applied practice augments gold standard causal inferences to, that fail to fully capture social complexity. Now, urban complexity is something that's rather new even within the bioethics community, but urban bioethics accounts for the needs of the city and seeks to leverage whatever resources there are in that community through engaging all of the members of that community. Bioethics must work with the community and not on behalf of the community. So often we have situations where we're telling, telling communities what, we, what they need and not asking them what they need. Marginalization of African-Americans is both afflicted by others and causes suffering upon this population. This time together, we'll concentrate on demonstrating that complexity, systems thinking, and urban bioethics are material to unravel systemic urban inequities. Now I'm going to give you some statistics to show what is the situation of African-Americans. And again, this is in the United States. According for the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, Blacks experience disproportionate health concerns that increase the likelihood of pre premature morbidity and mortality. African-Americans are more likely to die at earlier ages for all causes. African-Americans age 18 to 34 have higher prevalence of high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, stroke than their white counterparts. That's same for the age 35 to 49. As we age, there are even wider differences, difference of 11% for high blood pressure, 4% for diabetes and 1% for stroke. Now for those age of 50 to 64, we're getting close to retirement age. The gaps are even more pronounced, 20% difference for high blood pressure, 9% for diabetes and 3% for stroke respectively. Unemployment rates are higher for African-Americans as well. And living in poverty rates in African-American communities in all age groups are higher. There's a 9% difference in the 18 to 34 age group, but this difference increases to 11% difference once you reach the age of 30, 50 to 30, 64 rather, making African-Americans age 50 to 64 twice as likely to live in poverty compared to white counterparts. More African-Americans are not active across their age groups, which can definitely lead to chronic illnesses, and more African-Americans have obesity across all age groups as demonstrated here. 
29%, 18 to 34, 43% of African Americans are clinically obese from the age of 35 to 49, and 43% of African Americans have obesity from the age of 50 to 64. Now, my discussion today does not preclude the fact that there are personal, um, personal culpability in terms of disease status. However, there is something called intersectionality. And intersectionality means that there are different outside factors that come together that make it even more difficult for people of color, and in this case, African-Americans to be able to live healthful lives. And normally when we're talking about intersectionality, we're, we're mentioning things like sexism, racism, discrimination, um, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, various other um, um, articles in our society that are marginalized for whatever, for whatever reason. The reason why I'm mentioning kidney failure is this is a really striking ex example of health disparities for African Americans. I have a history of kidney failure in my family. So it's, I've seen firsthand the difficulty of navigating this disease. Now, African Americans suffer from kidney failure at a significantly higher rate than whites, more than three times higher. African Americans constitute 35% of all kidney failure patients receiving dialysis, but we represent only 13.2% of the overall US population. And we will revisit this kidney, this, I'm sorry, this kidney data in the presentation of my systems model for social support. Broad determinants of health. And as you can see, we have this pinwheel that has several different determinants. Um, built environments, personal, personal issues. But urban health experts now know that built physical, social, and economic environments are crucial factors in maintaining and improving health. Health experts now know that there are broader and more important determinants of health than, our, than the availability of medical care. As demonstrated, African Americans be able to bear the brunt of suboptimal outcomes. And let's break that down just a little bit. So the next slide, I have a partial web of urban health determinants. All of these determinants are connected based on empirical evidence and correlations. Um, for instance, you'll see that comorbidity comor is connected to every single um, node that we have in this system. Out migration, which means white flight. It, in the United States, there is a, um, an instance of white Americans who leave or flee predominantly minority pop, um, areas and flee to exurbs and suburbs, which are very homogeneous as far as racial composition and very homogeneous as far as income, where they tend to skew middle class or upper class. So as the systems map illustrates, the complexity of health outcomes lies in these ties, resting on diminished social capital and entrenched negativities for urban health. This figure illustrates which parts interact, which ones do not interact, which parts self-organize, and how an urban health system may emerge. Each point in the model is interconnected with the welfare of others, which present in different proportions of the ties. We're well aware of how ties work. Making assessments without the other nodes precludes any meaningful findings in terms of these social determinants. So more specifically, public health and bioethics must recognize in our work that in order to have a moral society, it is not one where we make a pronouncement that we, that we improved one circle, one square, or one triangle. A verbal model is one that, let's see, I'm gonna skip something. Um, the concentric model of health-bound networks is a model that seeks to examine changes and support for chronically ill patients. And so you can see that we have overlapping social networks. The society is not defined through isolation, but rather our association through a network of social, social networks. 
So this particular model, which is the concentric model for health, health networks, illustrates these nested communities, which I've labeled as spheres. These overlapping networks proposed by the model are communities built with differing degrees of assistance for a person living with kidney disease. And that's just for an exemplar. It could be any other um, health issue. And so what I have are four spheres of overlapping communities. The first one is the kidney network, which is illustrated. It can also be called the health network more generally. Then you have the general well-being network, the social network, and the polis. And let's remember that this is a disease that requires that you have social support in order to navigate it. Blacks and African Americans have three times higher rates. So this is something that would afflict those living in urban centers. So let's move on. So we have something called direct or intermediary ties that I have in my model. And direct tie, to direct migration rather, is taking an ultimate path with a final, finality and destination. And I call that direct. An example of that would be a physician or a nephrologist. A nephrologist would not be taking the patient to the doctor, would not be taking the, the patient to the um, to the store, for instance. However, if that per that nephrologist or that physician would be very entrenched in the everyday care of that person as far as medically, and so that person would be in that kidney network. In the polis, as we continue to go out, that person is less involved in the, in the everyday. So the polis is essentially all of us, but within three to four walks out, there's the possibility that we can move closer into relationship with that ego and be more of assistance. So as we've discussed before, uh, networks affect changes and they actually toggle with our ethics. Now there are two important properties of community, I'm sorry, complex ethics. And the first one is network resilience, which is concerned with maintaining the health of a, of a network, and second would be community structure. Now, the more investment that a person has in the health of someone, the harder it is to leave, even if that supporter is not in a good place to help. And the people that are more likely to help are kin. And research has shown that within kin networks, older African-Americans receive most of their support from, from their kin. For younger African Americans, their help tends to come from their social network or their friends. And so there's a very great possibility that these individuals that are helping them also have um, health issues that are also very complicated for them as well. So we're gonna move just a little bit more quickly, but complexity, we all know what complexity is, but we need to account for the persistent variety of the new moving parts and the interaction of individuals. And I wanna mention four domains from social complexity. Gerald Midgley re revisited his four distinct domains of complexity, which he introduced in the 1990s. They are natural world complexity, social world complexity, subjective world complexity, and complexity of interactions. Now, the massive uncertainty of being well requires all of these domains. And imagine for a moment the requirement that we have to take care of all of these things at the same time. Now, health is the epitome of uncertainty. Batty made a comparison of cells to living kind composed of them stating, quote, the essential distinction between agents and cells is that agents motivate their own actions, are, unquote. And our human actions are not immune from risk or uncertainty. Better yet, being imperfectly human is the coupling of these four domains. We're gonna move forward. Systems thinking, in my opinion, is not big words or dynamic images, but rather fearlessness amid the uncertainty. So I'm going to speak to what I call the diffusion of disadvantage. Urban centers largely lack proximity of likes attracting likes, but they all tend to be those blessed with class 
or racial birthright tied to homogeneity. We live in a diffusion of over dis, of dis disadvantage. Biologically, we have semi-permanent membranes that pass only certain reactants and restrict that passing of others to maintain volume. However, what agent in this urban health situation works in this line of marginalization and social capital? People actively work towards goal-seeking behavior, and in this case, seeking social advantage. Social capital is a network of relationships between people who live and work in a particular society. The problem lies in the existence of multiple societies, the privileged or not. And I say the semi-permeable boundary of marginalization fills in with the negative and doesn't pass in the positive, positive capital. So, so urban society is obstructed with a structural osmosis, one that unequally is permeable to disbenefit, but is less apt to pass through positive social capital. Urban bioethics. Urban dwellers should not be expected to thrive within diminishment, but activating them must be a part of the solution. The act for action was waged by Bluestein to revisit bioethical paradigms and center agency, solidarity, and social justice. Urban bioethics sets a challenge if we take it. Then again, this challenge was set forth two decades ago. Bluestein and Fleischmann state that the appropriate way to serve urban health is not to force the traditional um, modes of inquiry to the urban center. This calls for bioethics to provide a schematic that takes into account human and social complexity. I'm running out of time. I'm gonna to go to this. Um, I've created something that I call com complexity ethics. And so this is, this is uh, a mechanism that characterizes both micro and macro moralities. And what I mean by micro moralities, those are the moralities held by the person themselves. Macro moralities are those that are, um, are collectively held by the community at large. And so in its simplest terms, indigenous, endogenous rather bioethics is essential to understand the system of moralities. Compared to others, micro elements do not corner the mark on the change of a system, according to Block and Davidson. On the contrary, the mark micro levels do not completely encapsulate causal effects. Therefore, emergent change is still possible at the macro level. So on to complexity ethics. I've developed this framework called complexity ethics, which surveys this micro and macro morality and health outcomes with the principles of complexity science and provides an external and explicit model for representation for bioethics to, to follow. The complexity ethics does not shy away from complexity and system science. And the complexity ethics is based on 10 complexity science-based strategies to untangle public health ethical dilemmas. First, iterations is a requirement to continue to openly retool systems as systems by nature adapt over time. It's important to use a systemic model as a basis for, under, for figuring out the most ideal systemic intervention. The power that's derived by, is by external forces is called energy. Interdependency is comprised of three elements. First, several interconnected unique agents, levels of engagement and influence that may differ and agents that vary. In order for the definition of systems to apply, the elements of urban health interweave and cannot be disentangled to hold this urban health meaning. If the components could stand on their own and lead to meaningful change, we would have already reversed health disparities. On the contrary, interdependence is a strength of urban health if we allow it to be. This property allows interdependence, I'm sorry, interaction, which is the lifeline of any system. In terms of human, I'm sorry, human urban health, we can then develop an ethical intervention based on the system. Malleability is, pertains to social networks and other forces that can change. 
Ethical positions can change whether they're scaled as the individual, as micromorality, or as the population as macromorality. So we have four questions to pose for bioethics and public health in general. Do social elements targeted by ethics involve flow of information among agents broadly defined? Two, must ethics account for social structural change that create different circumstances? Three, is the influence of the system collectively possibly linked to structural, structural issues? And lastly, do ethics involved in ex, or do ethics involved in altering choices when agents are exposed to similar or dissimilar circumstances? And lastly, there is a misconception, modern, a fundamental misconception to mistake for a problem what exactly, what exactly is only a mathematical exercise. One would do well to remember the old Kantian maxim, maxim that experience without theory is blind, but theory without experience is a mere intellectual play. Berthelotti, 1962. Life is indeed uncertain and simultaneously certain that a solution is not far away or impossible. As clinical outcomes change and then they do not change, the system continues to move and urban dwellers hitch a ride. But what is lacking is the moral tenet of policy to allow public health to be more proactive. Bioethics must adapt to these specificities of urban health, but not the other way around. And bioethicists must dutifully become agents of social change whereby declaring deliberately that marginalization of any kind is in itself immoral. Should every ethical question require such discernment of social justice? If justice is more broadly defined as revolving divergent discordant resol resolutions in society, then yes, this disparity in urban health should not be. Systems thinking moves urban health beyond historically ingrained reductionist approaches that more often entrench the very disparities that reactionary approaches are meant to reverse. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Michelle. It was um, interesting. Uh, I opened the questions. I have some questions, by the way. Very well, very good. I I'm so sorry I had to skip some slides. Thanks. So, uh, so in other, I, I was thinking uh, COVID-19, no, you said at the beginning, uh, was not equal. No? That's we know everywhere in the world. So, uh, and this uh, probably is um, a situation that uh, amplified uh, all these uh, aspects that you discussed. So how do you, put this element in your system thinking? I mean, how you can include this element and how can you help to find a strategy or solution, not solution probably, but some strategy, some ideas? Well, I think that COVID-19 has shown that our system has already, has already been broken in many ways. And we tend to approach health or public health as just one element that we're attacking at one time. And we know that that is very much the reverse of what we want in systems thinking. The problem with the, the very urgent, the urgency of COVID-19 is it's not perceived that we have the time to take a very systemic approach to this problem. At this time, what we're concentrating on is epidemiological data trying to look at spread, um, proximity, herd immunity, uh, things of that nature. Eventually, we need, to be, we need to be discussing who are the individuals who are contracting the disease. And I can't speak for other countries, but for the United States, it's primarily those who are of color, African-Americans, uh, Latinx, and indigenous. Um, that's not to say that individuals from other stratas are not inflicted by COVID, but in the United States, African-Americans and people of color tend to work in 
um, industries that require that they have face-to-face -face contact, whether that's service, um, whether that's um, healthcare. So they do not have the ability to stay home and stay close, cloistered away from COVID-19. And as we all know, we're all are waiting with bated breath for a vaccine, but then the discussion is, um, will there be parity in the distribution of those vaccines? Who will receive those vaccines first? And so if we are really taking into this consideration health disparities, we need to ethically decide who is in need, more ur urgent need of those vaccines. So yeah. that's very much in discussion and will continue to be debated. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, I got the point. I'm, I'm thinking, yes, you, you, you mentioned all these important points. So the people that, of course, had to go to work, no, to the job, because they cannot work at a, with a laptop like us, uh, uh, of course, are less lucky. And in this case, they cannot maintain this uh, social distance. And that's one point. I was asking, I was thinking, uh, was, uh, in your opinion, also the... Uh, the the city house that you know these these city are built because mm -hmm. very so good also could be uh, one yes point. yes it is it is a bubble it's, yeah. it's a bubble in the United States African Americans tend to dominate um, urban centers and we do call those um, black urban centers um, with very few people who do not look like them so it would be black brown. Um, if you're discussing the fact that lack of transportation, you are there in that, in that center, you're working in that center. Um, the housing, if um, the network of Af African Americans and people of color is abysmal in relationship to their white peers. So without worth and without any equity or collateral, they're unable to move from those urban centers. And it's not to say that the urban centers themselves are, are not helpful. What it is saying is that there are elements in the urban planning that needs to be taking place. If a family is living in a home that has um, many generations within that home, then there is an, a, an increased risk for COVID. If a person is living in a neighborhood that's unsafe to navigate back to the issue of obesity, then they're not walking in their neighborhoods. Um, so we have to determine what kind of um, personal blame and what I love about systems thinking, it is not about the personal blame. It is about looking at the interconnection between all of the agents and what action is happening within, within those systems. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason why I feel that uh, systems thinking um, needs, to, needs to be used in this situation. Mm -hmm. Are you collecting all these data? Are you doing some models just to, I don't know, maybe also to predict or to suggest some possible, uh, I don't know, way to change uh, the situation? Are you doing some models as well? Or? I am not presently, but if anyone's interested, I am game. Okay. Because um, yeah, bioethics, bioethics has, a, has an element that's called empirical bioethics. It tends to be qualitative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Qualitative so not, but the data are available. So you have all this data uh, regarding, I don't know, mobility or uh, also, um, yeah, density of population in uh, some cities, big cities. I mean, like, I don't know, Chicago, no big cities, or also small. Not, not at this point. Not um, at this but many, my model of social support would be if someone's interested in doing ego networks and really parsing out how those nested communities um, um, fold as far as stru structural holds and structural folds, how they're overlapping. So I'm look very much looking forward to trying to validate that model um, anecdotally and from the evidence from um, public health and health promotion, this would seem to be able to be uh, applicable to this situation, but it's yet to be formally um, yeah, you know, formalized, yes. investigated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. May I ask a question? Yes, sure. Because, hi, thank you for the seminar. It was very interesting. And I was wondering if uh, uh, the general scheme that you made uh, is uh, somehow specific for African-Americans or would you change something for 
other countries because you know that some elements are specific for USA or for example for Latinos that are a bigger community also in USA? I would say definitely based on disparities in the United States, I could have used Latinx, I could have used Native American indigenous, um, they would be rather interchangeable. But because I used the African American data and I was trying to warp it around that, um, I definitely feel that if you took it to another country, there are other cultural issues that may not be applicable, it would not be transferable. And so, um, for instance, the systems map that I showed, which is based on um, established evidence, some of those nodes may not be connected in the same way, but I do feel that it could be translatable and taken taken to other places. It would be exciting to see under um, a COVID situation, how that could be applied in Italy or, or Germany. But at this point, um, taking into account urban bioethics, it tends to look at health disparities among individuals in cities and individuals in cities tend to be people of color. Hmm. This would be anyway interesting you know, to apply to maybe only other situation where of course, uh, Maybe the, the weak person are different, but the situation is the same, you know. Yes, I think that I, I definitely think that things as far as humanity, there are common currents that we we would all accept. But in the United States for people of color, as I mentioned, the intersectionality, um, there's the dealing with racism, discrimination, um, lack of social capital, financial stressors, which are unique and have historically been found in the evidence to be so. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of taking it out of the urban bioethics, certainly I think that that's, that's definitely possible. I think it could be taken to other places, but if you wanted to necessarily like look at the Roma population, I still think that because there are disadvantages that are inherent to that population, I do think that that could be uh, carried over, but the conceptualization was definitely brought from a standpoint of disparity. And for those who do not have access to the same resources as others. Yeah, thanks. Other questions? Of course, the big problem of obesity is also another issue very important because of course COVID-19 you know, uh, hit particularly the people that have a health problem with the heart and so obesity is one of the, uh, one of the main major issues. So it's like you know, something that is of course related and um, no way to, to find a... So just maybe I, I, I wanna just to, to tell you what do you think um, what what do you, you know, what do you think will be the the solution actually a possible uh, plan to you know quite points that maybe would help this situation at least in your in us where there is a situation very specific for that country what do you think um, in terms of not only of policy, but I mean, uh, uh, urban planning uh, also from the urban point of view, health point of view altogether. Well, in terms of health disparities, it's not just access to medical care. And that tends to be the first go-to um, factor that we look at as far as um, dependent factors looking at, um, um, in looking at that. Um, there is water contamination, there's, there's violence, there's drug use, there's unemployment, there's lack of, lack of employment that gives living wages. Um, I think that what tends to happen and has happened historically is saying that I'm going to do an intervention that um, deals with transportation issues. And it tends to not be the transportation that is deemed to be put as far as urban planning in su suburbs. We're not talking about um, uh, trains that will get you somewhere in 15 minutes. We're talking about the basic necessities of having a bus or a train with several stops that gets that person um, to that job. I remember very distinctly, I have my job, my, my car broke down and that happens to everyone. And I, for a while I was using a bus 
and my job was 20 minutes away and it took an hour and a half to get to work. So if you can imagine someone of means and I had to do that only briefly, a person without those means having to get their children to school, having to get to a job that may require them to go outside of their community in order to have a better wage to take care of their and take care of their family or take care take care of themselves. So as far as applying it, I, I think that we def definitely need to get out of this idea that if we're attacking one part of this, of one factor that we're going to find that solution. As Donetta Meadows says, we need to find those leverage points. We need to find those points that they're going to have the biggest, biggest impact and the biggest bang for our buck. And sometimes those leverage points are the ones that are most controversial and the ones that are less apt to be brought up in these discussions. So I think after this COVID-19, after we get through this, there's gonna to have to be um, very deep discussion of how we handle um, emergencies of this nature and how do we protect those who cannot fully protect themselves in this situation. Thank you. No, thank you. Health and wellness to everyone. Okay, thank you. Other questions? I'm done. Okay, thank you so much. Michelle, thank you. Very interesting. And uh, we can move, uh, Alessandra, you can, uh, oh, yes, you can. Okay, so stage. <laughs> <laughs> I can introduce the next uh, speaker, that is uh, Rong Xiao Ji, uh, who is uh, a PhD student in University of Milano in uh, the Big Math project that I am coordinating. Uh, and uh, well, she studied uh, partially in China and partially in Lisbon before uh, enrolling in this project. Um, and now she's working uh, together also with uh, a company called Trilateral, which is a company producing uh, um, um, software and uh, for virtual reality and so for video games and uh, animation movies. She is trying to study uh, the problem of uh, detecting the emotions of uh, human beings from uh, videos of, uh, uh, of human beings uh, while they are speaking. Um, and uh, well, our, she will present uh, her research uh, in this field Clearly, the results are still uh, somewhat preliminary, but uh, we are open to any uh, comment and suggestion that may come from, uh, from the audience also in this case. So please, uh, G, if you can. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Just let me try to share my screen. Yes. Uh, can you see it now? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So I can start. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rong Jiao Ji, and uh, I'm a PhD student from University of Milan. So for this virtual seminars, I will talk about my PhD research about mathematical morphology for the prediction of face expression, transition, and emotions. So I'll first describe briefly about my problems and then we'll talk about the methods. So if you notice, uh, there are two keywords uh, in my topic, the emotions and then the expressions. So for the expressions here, we refer to this facial action coding system. Uh, we also call it facts. So it is actually a computer system trying to categorize the physical expressions of emotions and then to produce temporal profiles of the facial movement. So uh, based on the facts, uh, actually we can try to describe the contraction or relaxation of the muscles on our face uh, with, uh, with this action unit. So we can deconstruct from the facial expressions under the temporal evolutions and then get the action unit curves. 
So here in the left side, I bring you some examples of the uh, corresponding muscles with respect to each action unit. So uh, for the emotions in our daily life, normally we have among eight emotions. For example, this angry, happy, disgusted. And in, uh, from a video with a certain emotion, we can use some data extractor such as open face and so on to get the uh, action units changing along the time. So here I showed you briefly three examples related to our eyebrows, uh, our nose, and then the lips. So you can see it is like changing along the time while we are extracting the data from the uh, performance of the videos. So for our objectives, uh, first we want to identify the main expressed emotions or quantify the mixture of them. Uh, and then we want to explore some latent patterns of these uh, expressions. So it is common to uh, specific human emotions, regardless who is the performer. And then uh, finally, with the knowledge that we can obtain, we want to apply the identified patterns in building avatars, so to achieve a better performance in animations. So uh, after uh, showing you about our uh, problems and objectives, so there are some methods that I have tried. And I can first start with this curve alignment. So given several videos with both emotion discussed, uh, we can see that uh, the actors give the performance uh, uh, with different starting and ending points. And they also uh, speak with different speeds. So for example, if we collect only the data without aligning them, uh, we will have problems to identify the clear shapes and the most important characteristics. So we want to, uh, well, keep the uh, variation of amplitude of this action unit curves. We want to remove the phase variabilities. And that means we want to align all these curves into a common uh, timeline and then uh, without uh, losing the information of the ships. So, Mathematically speaking, uh, for the observed uh, curves, uh, we can uh, extract out the means and then do the common, do the classical uh, functional decompositions. And for each observed curve, we can build a so-called warp function. So for this warp function, it can uh, build a projection from the common registered timeline. This is something we want to get to the observed unregistered timeline. So uh, for this registered curves, uh, we can then use the inverse of the warp functions and then write it in the same form of the observed uh, curves. Well, notice that uh, actually, at this moment, uh, the functions with a phi n uh, with uh, re uh, respect to the inverse of the observed timeline uh, is no longer the eigenfunction of the covariations of the observed curves. So actually, if we still apply the original like decompositions of the data, the estimation would be distorted. So we need to uh, use some registered method. Here we use the principal component based registration method to register the action unit curves on the common speaking speed. So I can show you some results. Uh, in the left part, it is the uh, original curves that we absorb 
uh, in these three emotions, neutral sadness are discussed. And after the alignment for this action unit number 25, which represents leap apart like this R uh, movement, um, we can see that uh, it is more concentrated, the curves, and especially for the second half, it is uh, more clear. We can see the peaks and uh, uh, tendencies of the curves. Yeah, so there are actually some other methods we can use to visualize uh, the result of alignment. This one is so-called modified band depth. So modified damp depths uh, represents the average proportion of coordinates of a curve X inside of the bands. So these bands uh, are defined by every two different function, functional curves uh, in our uh, subset. So actually, uh, this part, it represents the proportion of the time when x is in the band. And then we sum of the proportion uh, on, all the, uh, on every two different curves uh, in our uh, subset. And we can get a, a band that with most concentrated part in this pink and the black means the most representative curves. So this one is actually uh, for the uh, observed unalignment curves, how it looks like. Where after the alignment, we can see that there are more clear the uh, shapes uh, because we are considering the action unit number 25. So we can see it is more related with our pronunciations uh, when we are uh, speaking. So uh, it shows that uh, the alignment is necessary. So after the alignment, uh, we can see that the curves uh, is not smooth enough and always have some little turbulence in the local structure. So we try to apply this wavelet denoising method uh, to get uh, better results for the input curves. So for to explain you about the uh, theory of uh, wavelets for any uh, raw signal or like any time series, we can use this wavelet functions and its uh, transformations to filter these curves and then to do the multi-resolution analysis in different levels of the filtrations. So for example, uh, here, like we have this uh, mother and father wavelet. So we can build the, con uh, we can construct the subspaces, so called VM and WM. So VM here, it represents at the M level, the approximation of the original curves. Well, this WN is at the M level about the noises decomposed from the uh, curves. So we can see that this VN, uh, VI include those further wavelets, keep the, keeps the time domain properties because it's like approximation of the original curves. Uh, well, for the mother wavelets WI, it kept the frequency domain properties. And uh, we can uh, do this multi-resolution analysis and then derive the orthogonal decompositions of the space L2. So this space is actually uh, for a continuous curve how, where the space is. And we can then decompose our space into the approximations with the noises at different layers. So for example, uh, if you see here at the bottom, this X is a raw signal or a time series. And then we can decompose it to this V1 space. So it is a smoother uh, uh, curve compared with the original one, where the noise is falls in this W1 space. 
and uh, we can, uh, following this calculation, we can get the corresponding coefficients for both two uh, functions, uh, both functions in two spaces. And uh, as we already show the examples in wavelets level one, so here the x, x, uh, x uh, time series has already been dec uh, decomposed to v1 and w1. So for this uh, v1, we can further decompose it into w2 and v2. So we can see here v2 compared with a v1 space, the curve is more, uh, is more smooth and uh, the main shape is still kept. So if we increase the number of wavelet levels, and then we can see that the ship's getting smoother and smoother. Uh, well, the thing is that at wavelet level four, uh, like this uh, little peak, the structure at this time point is barely appeared. So actually we think like it is decomposed too much and we lose some information in this resolution. So we choose the wavelet level three uh, as the parameters we want to consider. Yes, so here is like a virilization of the denoised data. So again, for the following the examples we showed before, we have this uh, eyebrow curve, the nose curve and the lip curve. Uh, after the denoising, uh, we can see here, for example, in this uh, eyebrow curve, uh, this little turbulence has been uh, removed and uh, we can get a, a mathematically more beautiful curves while the main structures is still kept. Yeah, so here we go to this topological data analysis. Uh, topological data analysis provides a general framework to analyze the data in a manner that is insensitive to the particular metric chosen and provide dimensionality reductions and a better uh, robustness to noise. So which is actually uh, very suitable for our case. Uh, so let me first describe like the uh, mechanism of topological data analysis. So it actually goes from point clouds to generate so-called the persistence diagram, which still kept the main topological structures inside. So the process of drawing this persistent diagram, uh, so here we consider the special case with sub-level set filtration of the function f. Is that, so if you see like this is the time series f, that we want to uh, consider, and we kept incre we keep increasing the uh, height of this gray area. So when this gray area first touch the curve uh, at this bad, uh, bottom point of the curve, and a hole start to generate, and one uh, two holes connected which e with each other, we we let one horse still grows up and then we record this horse to be dead. So that means we can uh, have, uh, we can record the deaths and uh, the births and the deaths of every horse. Uh, so if we use the, if we treat the births uh, as the X axis and the deaths as the Y axis, Actually, we can replot those bars here to one specific point uh, at, in the persistent diagram. So we will later on focus on this persistence diagrams to do the analysis. So I'll give you an um, example here. 
for this curve. And after we use wavelets to denoise it, uh, we start to consider, for example, a line here and then move it up. So during this process, we can generate these persistent diagrams. Uh, we can uh, generate this persistence diagram and uh, note that uh, the points that are close to the diagonal line are actually the noises. So we set the threshold to be 0 0.1 and then we cut the noises down. So this is like a persistent diagram that we want. So here, for example, we already have two curves, uh, F in red and G in gray, and we can generate uh, two persistence diagrams for them. So you can see that actually in these persistent diagrams, we use the bottleneck distance uh, to compute as the differences, a uh, difference of these two persistence uh, diagrams. So bottleneck distance is actually a special case for Wesson-Stein distance in our infinity space. So after uh, we get, we calculate the paired dis uh, the distance for each uh, pair of the ob observations for each uh, for uh, the data in each emotion action unit combinations, we can compute the mean and the variance of all this. Uh, bottleneck distance inside of that group. So here I can show you first like the for eight emotions and then we have here 17 action units, this main table. Uh, well, we also highlight for each variate the top three uh, largest value, uh, values uh, and we can see like uh, the larger the mean value is means the more uh, engagement degrees the muscle is for each emotion. And for the variance as well, we highlight the, those uh, like three smallest values uh, because here, if we consider its variance, the slower, uh, the smaller the variance, it means the uh, data set under one specific emotion is more concentrated. So the behaviors is more uh, persistent, uh, which can tell us uh, as an indicator uh, which action unit uh, works for uh, which uh, works uh, more for for which emotion. So here I highlight in color yellow those uh, pairs that have uh, that have both larger mean values and then smaller variance. So for example, we can see emotion four means sadness and it has a uh, very good properties with action unit number 14 which is mouse dimpler so it's like yeah uh, this movement to uh put your mouse corner a little bit deeper inside so uh yeah actually uh from the analysis of topological data we can get uh the get some explanations for the uh, emotions based on the action units in this way. So the last part I want to talk is uh, order patterns and uh, together with the results shown in networks. So for order patterns, we here consider a time series like this, X over T, and we study all the uh, factorial permutations of uh, order D. So this is actually the uh, possible order types of these different numbers. So for example, uh, if we set D equals to three with steps tau equals one, so there are actually 
uh, three factorial equals six different possible permutations. So like either fall down or go up or up down in different ways. Yeah, so in that, uh, in this way, we can actually uh, decompose our time series to a series of order patterns. So uh, actually here we can uh, look better about the local structures and local tendencies. So this is another uh, example of how we generate this uh, order patterns. So this is actually a time window. We start to move it from point zero and then uh, we can uh, build uh, simultaneously the order patterns for in different types. So for example, inside of these windows, all this, uh, both this red and purple curve goes up, so it falls here and then falls down, so it falls here. Well, at this moment, like this green curve has different uh, behavior with the other two. So you can see here, like uh, it falls into this pattern. Yeah, so it is actually another way to discretize the time series and then get more information about the local structures. So uh, here you can see with multiple uh, time series, we can do, fo do following the same way to get the order patterns for each variate. And then uh, actually we want to consider both their uh, connections and then the correlations. So we built this method uh, so, uh, so sorry, we applied this method. It was uh, introduced in this article. Um, here we at each time point T, so we consider two variates I and J, for example, the first two. If, uh, so if they are encoded by the same symbol, for example, it also first goes up and then uh, first goes down and then goes up. And we consider this I and G as uh, functionally connected. So for this entry of the adjacency matrix A, we set the value to be one. Otherwise, we just set the value to be zero. So at each time frame, we can generate a um, network like this. And then if we move along the time window, we can get a series of these networks. Yeah. So here I want to show you that for all the observations uh, with one emotion, so I showed you the emotion uh, discussed, we can also define the weights by the frequencies of the occurrence of uh, each pair of action units at each frame. So for example, we can set for this pair action unit number four and six to be to have the weight 0 0.375. Yeah. And in that way, we can build a network at each frame with the links. And uh, so this links has the uh, uh, like uh, it, the links show the weights inside. Uh, also, we try to color this weights because like it's the uh, connection of the action unit among all the observations under this uh, emotion, uh, under this uh, emotion discussed data set. So it is uh, normally all connected, but we want to separate it with uh, different colors about the different weights. So we set the width less than 0 0.3 to be yellow and uh, the width between 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 to be orange. The width larger than 0 0.5 to be red. So this is like the most correlated links. So for the further analysis, we try to cut down the weights with the links with very small weights. Uh, 
and then this is like a network analysis result I want to show you. Um, so for uh, so here, like we have three emotions. So we want to focus on emotion seven. They discussed. So we colored it in red, and then we compared it with two emotions, the neutral one and the calm one, neutral in green and calm in orange. So uh, if you see like uh, in our daily life, we show neutral and calm in relatively similar way. In, in our network analysis, the two curves in green and orange should follow like similar trend. So here actually from our plot, we can see that this orange and green goes in the similar way. Well, at some point, for example, around this uh, area and this area, uh, the discussed have very different network structures. Well, at this point, uh, the um, at this point, the action unit, uh, the uh, emotion discussed uh, has different tendencies. So we highlight both these three areas. And uh, I just want to remind you that here we are studying the uh, densities of links in these networks. So it is defined as the fraction of links in a network to the total number of possible links. So how connected the plot is, the network is. Yeah. And then uh, for this plot, I want to show you another property of network. So it is called clustering coefficient in the network. So imagine that like if two persons uh, um, uh, if two persons have a common friend, then they are more likely to know each other. So this is the same. Like if two nodes are in the neighborhood of one node, and then these two nodes are more possibly to be connected. So the clustering uh, coefficient actually is a measure of transitivity. Uh, the same, like we can see at these two time points, the uh, emotion discussed have very different behavior with the other two. Uh, well, at this part, like we can see there is probably a little bit delay. So the value is also very different. And the last property of the network we want to analyze is the mean distance in the network. So we calculate this mean distance after we calculate the distance of every two nodes in the networks and then average them. We can see here also at this period and this period, the uh, distance, uh, the main distance is very large for the emotion discussed than the other two. Well, at this part, the tendency is different. So we actually uh, uh, collect all those uh, specific time points that shows very different behaviors of uh, this emotion discussed from emotion neutral and then I can show you here uh, for this frame number 39, 42, 63, 69, and 72, how the networks uh, look like, uh, looks, uh, look like, yeah. So you can see in generally speaking, um, in disgust, the links are less connected. Uh, 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 the links are connected with less weights uh, than the neutral case. Uh, also, for example, here, this frame uh, 42, only one significant correlations uh, shown compared with like the dense connections in this discuss uh, in this emotion neutral. So it also brings us uh, one opportunity to look 
for generally the sequence of the networks and where the things start to be different. Yes. So thanks for your attention. It is like a research work, it's still going on. So I'm very welcome for uh, any questions and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Ji. Yeah. So there are, are there any questions or comments from the audience? I have probably one strange question. Yes. yes <laughs> so, uh, because when you talk about disgust, uh, it is an, an expression that is developing, while neutral expression, why changes in time? And so could you use a neutral expression as a background somehow? Is this the basic noise of your? Uh, yes, uh, I see your question. Uh, the thing is that, uh, so for the in, uh, input videos where we extract out our uh, action unit data. Uh, actually, it's a performance given by the uh, doc, uh, actor, like they are speaking the same sentence, like for example, kids are sitting by the door. So they speak this same sentence, both in neutral emotion and in disgust emotion. Okay. Yes, so in that case, like, uh, for sure, like we can generate two sets of uh, action units. Uh, Neutral is not a still person, is a, no. is somebody that is speaking. Right. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. So this is uh, actually, you can see like uh, in this neutral emotions, uh, there is this uh, like ups and the downs, which represent basically like the words when we are speaking. And then you can see also for disgust, it is the same, like they're speaking the same sentences, but with the uh, disgust emotion, probably the actors want to stress some part and then delay on the other words. So it has different uh, behaviors, but we can register them on the same like uh, timelines. So the reason we also want to register it in same timeline is also we want to compare in this way vertically uh, between this neutral emotion and disgust. Yeah, because if the timeline is different and that means like we are comparing probably for the uh, kids like in the performance of neutral and R in the performance of disgust. So they are actually having the different behaviors based on the pronunciation itself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe it was uh, uh, not clear that we are using a, a data set uh, composed by videos uh, from, uh, I don't remember, 24 actors, uh, maybe, or yes. no, 12 male and 12 female, and they are all pronouncing the same uh, two sentences, uh, which are uh, kids are talking by the door and uh, dogs are sitting by the door, uh, expressing uh, different emotions. So they are pronouncing the same sentence uh, many times, uh, uh, and uh, with the different emotion uh, which is played essentially. This is why uh, the, the, uh, we need the alignment of the cures because uh, the, the videos uh, have more or less the same uh, duration but, uh, but clearly are not exactly the same depending on the speed of pronunciation of the sentence. Other questions or comments? Maybe, uh, Gilles, you could comment about the application of this research. I mean, uh, why uh, trilateral in particular, but in general, are we interested in detecting uh, the emotions uh, from yeah, the videos? Yeah. So, uh, and uh, 
sorry, I can interrupt. My question yeah. is also related to this. Do you mm -hmm. plan to, I don't know, to maybe do one day an application uh, with an emotional filter? I don't know, something like this. What is the relevant, uh, relevant uh, immediate application of uh, your study? Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, uh, because like uh, in uh, in the company of Three Lateral, what they are doing is actually like they can collect the performance of a real person with some landmarks on their face, and then they can generate uh, virtual characters following the uh, like same behaviors of those landmarks, like. Uh, collected from the cameras. So actually, like nowadays, if you want to uh, generate a virtual video with a virtual character, you need to ask like the people to behave the same. Yeah, but uh, later on, uh, like nowadays, I think in the animation like field, they can generate just like a new uh, uh, virtual characters based on some images of some uh, people. And then like they have their algorithms to generate the uh, like leap movement without the videos from the real people. So for example, like uh, if you just use my image and then create a uh, virtual characters, it can speak like by itself if you type in the lyrics you want uh, it to say yeah but uh, there is actually like for this emotion part it's actually a uh, harder work to do because um, emotion is something very um, how to say hard to cl uh, classify even for uh, our human beings because we classify the emotions not only based on the performance of the face, but also the audio, like the tones you make, uh, you stressing a sentence, and also some body language behaviors or the eyesight. Yeah. So uh, if we just want to uh, focus on this uh, facial muscles, so we kind of want to generate, uh, uh, kind of want to find some patterns uh, for example, uh, we already know in the literatures that this uh, area uh, of this eyebrow, like the inner uh, brow riser, is always related with this nose winkler. So we want to see that, for example, in this discussed uh, whether, like uh, when we want to show the disgust emotion, we probably first will uh, put down our inner bro and then to uh, do the nose winkler. So if there are some patterns like one happened earlier and then the other happened later. So if we can extract this information, uh, when we apply it to virtual actors, it can be more natural. Yeah, and uh, it does not need every time the performance from these actors. Yeah, that's something information we want to extract yeah, from our performance. Yeah. And, uh, one, one more. Thank you for the, the reply. Yeah. So, do you think there is some, um, I don't know, some main character that you can also find in animals, for example? I'm not saying emotionally at uh, this uh, level. Uh, of uh, like humans, but maybe I don't know, understand when uh, they are hungry or. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, like here, I mentioned this facial action coding system. So it's like for the human beings, we separate the muscles into different areas. Yeah, also for animals, there are, I don't remember, but probably the rabbit facts, like the fox facts. So in that way, like we can also define the correlated areas of a uh, rabbit face. Yeah. And then uh, it's kind of the same, like because we want to create those animals like to uh, 
for example, inside of the cartoon to mimic humans perform, uh, performance. So we can actually apply our knowledge we gathered from here, like from the data set of humans performance to the animals performance. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I can also add that uh, such techniques of recognition of emotion are also used by medical doctors uh, for, uh, uh, to detect the emotion, for example, of people uh, with autism or with uh, some impairments uh, in uh, ex expressing themselves. Uh, and clearly they can, can help a lot in communicating with these people. And uh, well, there is also another application that was stated by, by the company Trilateral with which uh, we work. Actually, they, their aim is uh, in some way to, to recreate, uh, for example, uh, actors which are famous now, uh, to recreate them uh, forever <laughs> in a virtual environment. Imagine to have forever a, a Julia Roberts or, uh, I don't know, a Brad Pitt. Uh, and clearly, uh, so this kind of instrument could be useful uh, to, to, to produce such kind of uh, characters. So any other question or comment? No. <clears throat> no, if not, I think uh, we can thank uh, both our speakers. Uh, they were really very interesting, both of them. Uh, and so, uh, okay, uh, we, uh, I still remind you uh, about the next uh, seminars uh, that will be in two weeks, no, three weeks from now, I think. Anyway, you can uh, look in the program uh, in our website. And uh, thank you again very much for your interesting presentation. And see you, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. Thanks. <laughs> bye. Nice talk. Oh, you guys well. <laughs> Take care, stay safe. You too.